Okay, so I think we're ready now for this evening's fun and games. Dear Ajahn Brahm, I do hands-on massage physical therapy. I often hold and watch along with the person lying down an area of pain. We breathe through it to help the area relieve, relieve tension. Is there any advice for deepening the work? It's as if we meditate together. Fun stuff. Many thanks. I don't really know too much about massage, physical, <coughs> physical therapy, except by doing it with my own mind. Just feeling parts of my body and like massaging with my mind. Also, of course, if anyone is anxious to do, notice the uh, corresponding uh, feeling in the body to every emotion which we have. And it's great to be able to do that, to hold and watch along with the person lying down in an area of pain. We breathe through it to help the area release tension. Yeah, if it works, great. Do it. But I'm not an expert on that. Oh. Dear Ajahn, how to deal with super mindfulness? Actually, if you get to be super mindfulness, you don't need much advice because I call it superpower mindfulness. It's just whatever you see in here is so beautiful, so wonderful, so peaceful. And that superpower mindfulness, it comes to stillness, so enjoy. First of all, you've got to know what it is, first of all. So just get to be mindful, first of all. And after being mindful, then get to be, um, what's it called, power mindful. You get to know how to, use, to what that is like, and it gets easier the more mindful you are. If a person in hell realm is determined by their guilt and what they think the punishment should be, what is the situation with psychopaths and narcissistic persons who have a sense of self-entitlement and no remorse of their actions? Do they go scot-free? Of course they don't. But it's sometimes the, the idea of even psychopaths, people who have uh, no um, sense of guilt or remorse. You know, I really challenge that. Because all the people which I have met, and some really sort of uh, monsters in prisons, they always have a sense of guilt, don't they? They hide it, and they hide it, and they hide it. And they may be able to, you know, may think that, okay, in their brain there's something missing there, or there's some uh, connection which is lost. But that's just the brain. The mind is something even stronger. So just like when people do get hypnotized, they can remember things which their brain has blotted out. And the, this is accessing the mind. And so that mind does keep a record of what you've done. And so it may be blotted out on the surface, but on the inside there is a lot of uh, remorse and guilt. <coughs> And the way we have to deal with that, we can hide it for a while, but it will come up again sooner or later, if not in this life, in the next. Because remember, when we make a hellworm, it's just after we die. So the brain is just uh, um, overcome and going to the, the mind. Could we, use <coughs> Could we use feedback brain scan? measures to help us get to Nibbutas jhanas quicker for an impatient being. Oh, maybe you can, but then sometimes you miss a lot on the journey. That's why that sometimes that I made the point years ago that I noticed that some uh, teachers and some monks, nuns, some had a very easy time of it and they become very peaceful, wonderful beings, but they can't teach very well simply because they've had not much experience of suffering. So they don't know what it's like. But those beings who have really been through it and had a lot of suffering and managed to get to the other side, they're amazing beings because they can really, really help. So sometimes to go to the quick path, you're missing out on a lot of experience where your life can be enriched. You go down the motorway and just go straight to the destination, you get there fast. But if you take this exit and then that exit and another exit, you learn a lot about just you know, what's on the other sides of the motorway. 
That's why sometimes I like getting lost. Dear Ajahn Brahm, I think you made it quite clear jhana is a path of nibbana. What do you think so one is a path of nibbana? <coughs> With stream winning, uh, so is actually what did it say? I won't have to do that too quick. What do you think stream winner is a path of nibbana? Of course stream winning is a path of nibbana because stream winning is a first stage, but um, are these jhanas necessary for stream winning? I hope that was the question you meant, otherwise it doesn't make much, make much sense. And if you ever look ever, those people who study the suttas, there are some people who seem to be called a stream winner and they haven't done much at all. And especially the case, this was uh, in the time when uh, Devadatta, the Buddha's cousin, was attempted to kill the Buddha. And so ego and pride got the better of him and he just wanted to take over the uh, Buddhism. So what he did, he arranged, actually with the king of Jatasattva, he arranged an assassin to go and kill the Buddha. And then two assassins to knock off that one assassin. And then four assassins to uh, delete the two assassins. <coughs> and eight more assassins to make sure those four assassins never survived to tell the tale, and 16 to kill the eight, and 32 to kill the 16, to cover all the tracks. And so, this assassin came with his sword to kill the Buddha. Ah, oh. you, know, you just you can't do that to a Buddha. He's just too soft and kind and nice. And, oh. <laughs> Yeah, sometimes how can you, you kill a nice baby seal or a little kitten? I mean, oh, I can't do this. And so in other words, the Buddha just really laid on the compassion and kindness and just, the assassin can do it. And so the assassin then confessed and said, I'm sent here to kill you and I'm in big trouble now if I don't do the deed. <coughs> so the Buddha actually just taught him some compassion and kindness and uh, told him that there's another two assassins coming, so don't go that way, go another way to escape, so they won't catch you. And so that assassin escaped, but at the time, that assassin was said to become a stream winner. No mindfulness, no precepts, no jhanas, but the Buddha declared, you know, he was now a stream winner. And then the two came along looking for the one, and the Buddha said, <coughs> you won't find him. And they said, well, we come to kill him. And the Buddha just um, gave them some Dharma teaching, they became stream winners. And then the next four became stream winners, and eight, 16, 32. 63 people became stream winners, or assassins. So those of you here meditating and keeping precepts, you should try another one. No, don't. <laughs> And so that was some of the weirdest. But then afterwards, you know, you, again, by reading Sutras in Pali, you, especially the Vinaya, because the Vinaya are like the teachings of the rules and regulations for monks and nuns. But there you get a lot of understanding of how these words are used in normal life and what the meanings are. And the nearest comparison to English Suppose, suppose there were a mafia gang and you cheated them and then they said Venerable Chanda, you're dead. You cheated, you haven't paid the bills of the drug lords or whatever, so you're dead. They said, what do you mean I'm dead? I'm still alive, I'm breathing. What it means is your death is certain. And we use that in, even in English dead man walking, you're dead. It is whenever there's anything certain to happen in Pali, it's as if it's already happened. So if you become what they call entering the path to being a stream winner, then your attainment of stream winning is certain. Before you, <coughs> before you die, you will have to see the Dhamma. And that's so, so it's a given. 
So the only way, and it's a valid way, to actually <coughs> understand how assassins could be declared by the Buddha to be a stream winner, he would have been more accurate, and he probably meant this, and everybody would understand this anyway, to say that they were now in the path of being a stream winner. They had been with the Buddha, they'd seen incredible kindness, incredible forgiveness, and they would have so much faith and confidence and listen to what he said, and what he said would have so much power coming from a person like that, that they would give up their, whatever they were doing, their assassin trade, and they would start to live a good life. And because of what the Buddha told them, they would eventually mature into being full stream winners. It is the confusion between the words, which we, again we use over in uh, in uh, English, that you know you're dead, or you know your happiness is assured, because you know you've come across uh, Buddhism and a, a great nun like Vinod Chanda, so your happiness is assured. It's when something is certain, then it's as if it's already happened. So we understand that that's, that's why that some people say, "Well, how can it be a stream when I?" They never practiced meditation or did any precepts or had any view. Yeah, but they had as much faith and confidence by coming up to see a Buddha. And so they're going to follow that path and they're going to get there. How and when do you eventually emerge from the jhana? If it is, I'll tell you this tomorrow, but I'll just say it in brief now. If it is a jhana, it's not just a moment. You go there for quite a while. The first time, you may go there a long time. That story of that monk <coughs> in Sydney, who just went in there too long. He didn't do his duties. <laughs> so, what one normally does, and what we, he should have done, is that if you feel that you know, the jhanas are sort of open for you, they're about to come, you make a resolution. I've already mentioned it in brief, called Programming Your Mindfulness. And you tell yourself, I must come out by, I don't know what, say, uh, by 11 o'clock to have my lunch. <laughs> it's not really a good reason. But I must emerge by 11 a.m. I must emerge by 11 a.m. I must emerge by 11 a.m. You set the timer by just telling yourself what you're going to do. And then, of course, that's the only way you can get out. Otherwise, it just stays until just... The only way you can call it the momentum which you took into the jhana, the momentum of letting go. When that wears out, then you come out again. Also, have you then developed or changed your views to the first noble eightfold path of the right view? What is actually is the right view? what has to develop. No, you don't automatically develop right view if you enter a jhana. And again, the obvious case is that uh, um, they were data. So, jhanas are necessary but not sufficient. Any scientist, mathematician, any sort of uh, logician know that necessary and sufficient conditions. A necessary uh, condition is without that, the effect doesn't happen. But it's not sufficient to actually to, to um, produce the results. It has to be a little bit more. So, uh, necessary and sufficient conditions. Jhanas are necessary, but you need something more. And that's usually good instructions. They usually say the words of another noble being. I know that the Tibetans often talk about transmission. And people think the Theravadas, no, we don't have transmission, but we do. You do need to have the example, the inspiration, the teachings of another uh, noble one. And that begs the question, well, what about the Buddha? He was supposed to be self-enlightened. Ha, ha, ha. Because Gatikara Sutta, very clear, it's in the suttas, there's no reason to actually to doubt the authenticity of that teaching in the Majjhima Nikaya. Majjhima 64, where he remembered being a monk under Kasapa the Buddha. And he was called Jyotipala. 
I did Jaiji Prana, I always get those two wrong. But anyway, he was a monk under Kasapa the Buddha. And uh, that was supposed to be this year, not that long ago. And you would expect he would remember something. Especially according to the standard accounts of the Buddha's enlightenment, going under the Bodhi tree, getting four jhanas, and after the four jhanas, recollecting his past lives. And one of them was under the Buddha Kasapa. So surely, all those years under the great Buddha, he remembered something. And of course he would. That was his seed, that was his transmission into this life, remembering the teachings. And that's obviously why under the rose apple tree, he just uh, uh, got jhana spontaneously. It wasn't the first time, it was from previous life. His inclinations that way. So for, <coughs> for that we need the deep meditations and also the good instructions from somebody else. Power to go through the court. <coughs> Any questions on that? Yeah. They say it can be in writing, but then, if it's in writing, it doesn't have the same oomph. I often mention this when people say, can you tell our, our children to stop texting each other when they're sitting right next to one another? <laughs> Why can't they talk and teach? And it's always the same thing, you know, you just, uh, you text one another, you send them an email, but it's that the same as just standing in front and actually conversing together. If it was, my sort of argument is, there'd be no reason why I had to fly all the way to uh, England. We could have a retreat in Perth, and I'd just uh, uh, put it on Skype or Zoom or something here, on YouTube, so you could just see it. Is it the same? You'll find actually, if you want to, I don't know what type of pop star you like to see, say Robbie Williams, why the, I only saw, remember him because I saw that only when we were on one of the tube stations, Robbie Williams was starving in something, I don't know. But anyway, see Robbie Williams live in the flesh? Why did you spend so much money for that? You can actually see a YouTube video of him. There's a difference. So sometimes it's not just getting the information, it's actually where it's coming from, it's something else comes across as well. You know, inspiration. So you can read many books on, on uh, Ajahn Chah, but actually seeing him face to face, that's a different ballgame. So you may text or <coughs> email you know, your, your wife or your girlfriend or boyfriend or something, but actually being right in front of them is a totally different thing. So with the best um, technology in the world, it's not the same as actually being there. Dear Ajahn Brahm, thank you for your teaching. On page 6, the Four Noble Truths, the stilling and disappearance of the will, is mentioned. Will is also a third of the four nutriments that uh, keep rise to the body. Do they both refer to Sankara? Um, it does refer to uh, Sankara, and what happens when you <coughs> stop at Sankara Samatha is like still these will, these uh, formations, this desire, this wanting, that leads to really deep states of meditation and to you disappearing. I think it was Schopenhauer, he sort of, I don't know how he got that, he got a hold of uh, some Buddhism, but that's, the will is what he really focused on in his philosophy and about just the will and suffering. And also the fact that that creates a sense of being. The more you will, the more you strive, the more you struggle, the more you are. <coughs> so it's, it's hard to let go of the will because it's like you're disappearing. So that's, Sankara is a very amazing word and that's why the Buddha said it's just pretty scary, not, few, not many people understand it, even accept the fact you can calm, you can calm the will. To show 
that sometimes there are funny stories in the suttas. <laughs> one of my favourite funny stories was there was a, 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 he used to be a general, but then he became a disciple of the Buddha called Chitta. And not to, uh, to um, be confused with you know, the mind, that was just Chitta also means like variegated, beautiful. Just like anyone who knows Malaysia, the North Malaysia has got a town called Chitra, and that was named after a Thai prince. Who, you know, the people were always invading one another, so he came there and took over that part of North Malaysia and called it Chitra, the town. So that's still there. But this fellow Chitta, that he was um, a very good disciple of the Buddha, he was actually supposed to be a non returner. The lay people could get non returners and be. Um, into jhanas. And so he just went to see um, Mahavira, the leader of the Jades, one day. And Krishna was in that area, in Nalanda. And so the leader of the Jades said, Ah, look, who's coming, a very senior disciple of the Buddha, the famous layperson Chitra. He said, We're just talking about thinking. And it, we hear we don't believe it, but we hear that you know, your master Gautama, the Buddha, says you can stop thinking. Do you believe that, that you can stop thinking? And Chitra said, no, I don't believe that at all. There you go, said Mahavira. These <coughs> Buddha says you can stop thinking. But even one of his famous disciples, Chitra, says you can't do it. He just said that to us. And uh, Mahavira said, it's just like trying to stop the current of the Ganges by putting your fist in it. It's impossible, it can't be done. And that's confirmed by one of the chief disciples of the Buddha. You can't stop thinking. And then Chitra was listening to this, he said, yes, I don't believe it can be stopped. I know it can be stopped, because I can get into jhana. These disciples of the Buddha are very sneaky. They're very tricky. You can't have a good conversation with them. <laughs> and it was almost like, you know, I, I laughed at that. Or like, I don't know, obviously there was a bit of competition between the Buddhists and the, the Jains. <coughs> and when I think the Buddha thought, I was asked, why are these Jains? And they say that you have to really burn off all your old karma to get enlightened. Which is why they're standing on one leg all the day, facing the sun, burning themselves. Or they're just not eating at all. Or they're just not wearing any clothes. And they, just, they really do it tough. And the Buddha replied, it was really a put down of the Jains. He said, well that proves that those Jains have made such a lot of bad karma in the past. They had to do that to get in line. Why is Buddhist? We haven't made so much bad karma, we're far more advanced, so we don't have to go through all that torment. I don't know what games. Anyway, you said you were the strictest teacher when it comes to jhanas. Why is that so? Why do you think other teachers are more lenient? It's not so much teacher as examiner. So, you know. And one of the reasons is, you know, we have things like jhana light these days. And there's a very famous teacher over in the United States, actually two, and they, they asked me to just come for tea. I didn't know what they were up to, and because they knew I was teaching jhana, they said, what do you think about this jhana light? I said, you're not jhana teachers, you're vipassana. He said, yeah, I know, but our teacher told us we have to do some jhanas now. And Jhana light was a very, it wasn't jhanas. A little bit of happiness, a little bit of peace, and they called it jhana. They wanted it so much, they lowered the standard. And it's similar sometimes, I've seen that, you know, just in academia. I don't know if you remember uh, Goethe's Dr. Faustus, it's an amazing book. And the first part of it, uh, was it Goethe lived in Frankfurt? I remember when I was there, not so long ago, just going past his, his house where he lived. And uh, Goethe's Dr. Faustus. Uh, Dr. Faustus, you know, was awarded a PhD. Only one PhD was awarded after 10 or 15 years. It really was a big event. You know, it was very hard to get 
a PhD and become a doctor. And that was why it was a huge event in, uh, in Frankfurt University at the time. But anyway, these days, PhDs are common. I'm not trying to put you down if you've got a PhD, but they're much easier than even 50 years ago. Standards do go down. MAs, bachelors, sometimes you can get a degree from Trump University. <laughs> Is that the same value as say from Oxford? You've still got a degree. So if it's from Oxford, the standard's much higher than say Trump University. So if you get accredited <coughs> from Ajahn Brahmjana University, it's much higher than other places. Do you understand? People always... I was talking with Ajahn Kate, that monk who was just so kind, he felt so safe in his presence, he didn't need to do anything. And the lady who was going in before me, that you know, I was just waiting, I was listening, and she was asking Ajahn Tate, I've just got this very peaceful experience, it was so peaceful, and uh, everything was very still. It was a jhana, wasn't it? He said, no, it wasn't, no, it was just you know, getting peaceful, carry on. And then she <coughs> said, no, it was fourth jhana, because it was so still and equanimous, I didn't care about anything. It was a fourth jhana, wasn't it? He said, no. And he carried on this, I was waiting you know, for her to get out, so I could go in. I was listening to this. <coughs> and then she kept on badgering him, and he said, um, it was a fourth time, it wasn't the. And then she went out with a big smile. Confirmed. <laughs> <laughs> Please excuse me, but I saw that and that's what happened. She wanted it so much. And there was another fellow who... I get not mind saying this. Uh, he was uh, told at a Sumatra when he visited Perth about his experiences and it was a streaming, streaming, wasn't it? It's a stream winning. <coughs> and Ajahn Sumedha just smiled. Confirmed. <laughs> <coughs> People want the confirmation of spiritual materialism. And so they want it so badly. If they won't get confirmation from Ajahn Brahm, they go to somebody else and somebody else. They'll shop around <laughs> until they get confirmed. Sorry, that's true, it's interesting, but that's why I forget who it was who wrote this book. And I had a list of five. So if you really want to get confirmation of jhanas, don't come to me. <coughs> I'll probably say no, well, others will say yes. Anyway, dear Sen Rajan Brahm and Venerable Chanda, twice now I've felt that my body has left my body and then goes back in. It's a little like falling asleep, but it definitely isn't falling asleep, if that makes any sense. You feel your, my body has left my body, and then comes back again. Is it like your awareness has disappeared and then comes back again? But it doesn't matter what it is. If it's peaceful and happy, explore it, let it happen again, see what happens. That's why even if it is a jhana, it's not the end, you have to keep on going. So, you know, if you say, oh, this is a jhana, wonderful, okay, carry on. Because even if it, if it was, you've still got more work to do. And if it isn't, you've still got more work to do. That's why you wonder why the heck do you want a sort of confirmation. So just keep on going, see what happens. Anyway, the people who think they've got jhana and haven't got jhana, I haven't told you yet about the time I got enlightened. <laughs> do you want to hear about when I got enlightened? I wrote about it in my book. So, only four years as a monk, meditating in the jungles, getting more and more peaceful. Oh yeah, that's because it's, you know, you've got to sort of hide these things, isn't it? Just, not every day you can sort of tell that how you've got a lunch. <laughs> you know, there's a catch to this. Anyway, so, really getting peaceful, getting lots of energy, 
lots of clarity because you know when you really get strong mindfulness and deep meditations your mind is so clear and you don't go looking for any insights they just come to you I was doing walking meditation about 1.30 in the morning no way I could go to sleep I was just too powered up this um, insight <coughs> came up and another insight was almost like tears were crying with this amazing bliss and beauty and understanding everything and then the big one came the big one wow Wow, now, now I understood. Another Arahat arose in the world. That was so cool. And there was bliss, energy, clarity, about two o'clock in the morning. No dullness or sleepiness at all. 2.30 and I thought, well, we've got to get up at three, so I'll just lay down. But he lay down, he was up in for five minutes. So I was there in the hall, meditating before anybody else. And the gong went, it didn't disturb me at all, it was just blissful. Bang! Bang! Oh, it was just so sonorous. And then they started the morning chanting. I had so much energy. It was in time, you know. Uh, I just was shouting it out, and afterwards, meditating so peacefully. No sloth and torpor, no restless. My mind was just like putty. I could mould it into whatever I wanted. It didn't resist at all. Oh, I was so blissful. Such a shame it didn't last that long. Because <laughs> then we went on arms round. When I went on arms round, and people put bits of rice in my bowl, I was blessing you. Don't know how lucky you are that you have just dropped the surprise into a new arahat. <laughs> that is immense merit. And then after just blasting them with blessings and loving kindness and why you don't know how lucky you are, all you villagers. And then afterwards when I got back into the monastery that there was normally just one dish. It was a curry. It was rotten fish curry, pladek. And what, was, what it was, was <coughs> a fish from the paddy fields a year before, which they would um, store in earthen jars. Then it would go off. It would be like pickled. But not like nice pickled. It was just put in a jar, a bit of salt, and covered over with a, a piece of plastic. It stank. <coughs> It was disgusting, and to show you how disgusting it was, I was a vegetarian before I became a monk, but you couldn't be, there was subsistence eating, there was no vegetables. So anyway, that one day when I was helping clean up around the monastery kitchen, I found one of the jars of rotten fish, and the plastic had been perforated. The flies had got inside and it was cornered with maggots. So I took it out to throw it away. And I got into trouble. The headman of the village saw me and said, what are you doing? And I said, look, it's, you know, it's uh, spoiled, it's got maggots in it, I'm throwing it away. He said, no way you're throwing it away. Give it to me, that's extra protein. So the next day we had that fish. It was gross. But that morning there were two pots of curry. Another one, which was, no, please excuse me, this is a meat curry, but it was from town. It was the sort of thing which, you know, was edible. And so I thought, wow, they don't usually have a second pot of curry. Today they have the heavenly beings <coughs> are celebrating my enlightenment. <laughs> they also want a piece of good karma too. And they brought this this edible curry, as well as the unedible one. And I thought, wow, this is amazing, good fortune. And so I sat there in the line, I was the number two monk, there was a senior monk sitting next to me. He was from that village, a local boy. And then he had the pot of curry, had, we had our rice, sticky rice, glutinous rice. And then he had the two pots of curry. I thought he would have you know, what he grew up on, one fish curry, but no. 
he took this huge scoop, I mean really huge scoop, three of them, into his bowl of the edible curry. And I thought it was really greedy, but it doesn't matter because I had plenty left for me to celebrate my enlightenment. <laughs> <laughs> but what it did next, what it did next was totally intolerable. <coughs> After taking his own, he took the remainder of the edible curry, poured it into the unedible one, and stirred it up, saying, it's all the same, it's all the same. <laughs> and I said, bloody hypocrite. If it was all the same, why did you take yours first? Why did you stir it up first and then take yours? All the same, you're a hypocrite. Now you... Oh my goodness. I was angry. And I knew enough that our hearts don't get angry. <laughs> That was really depressing. <laughs> to think you're enlightened and find out you ate. <laughs> I didn't care what I ate after that. <laughs> Be careful. Sometimes we think we're enlightened and then something rotten happens to us and we soon find out we're not. <laughs> that was really good fun, that story. When I thought I was enlightened, I found out I wasn't. <laughs> because there's a lot of colours. Anyway, thank you for being an amazing teacher. How would you recommend I best make friends with my ego will so I won't sneak up on me and I end up doing unwholesome actions? Let's give yourself a break. Don't work yourself too hard. <laughs> <laughs> and one of the things is that you know, sometimes we... Set such a high standard for ourselves. Lower your standards. <laughs> it's, you know, it's obvious psychology. If you try to be such a perfect person, such a great partner to you know whoever you live with, such a wonderful monk, such a, an impressive nun, you just get tense. Try to prove something to other people. Trying to show off because you're thinking you have to impress other people. A lot of times people get impressed by, they call it these days, authenticity. Yeah, you're sometimes fed up, sometimes you're sleeping, sometimes you're, you're grumpy, sometimes you make mistakes. What's wrong with that? That's one of the reasons why it's just such simple psychology. I make a rule in Bodhinyana Monastery. All the monks who stay there can make mistakes. Then they don't make so many. That's the way to get a higher standard, by lowering the standard. And then people just aren't afraid of making mistakes. They're not tense and tight, which means they don't make many. When they do, you laugh. Very funny. All my stupid mistakes which I made, after uh, I leave here, I go to Penang. And when I was in Penang once, there was this, you know, really devoted disciples. They really love and care for me. And so when I was leaving to go somewhere else, they, at the airport, they gave me this um, uh, milky coffee drink. It was absolutely delicious. Probably terrible for your health. But, you know, good to, eat, to drink. But they had this in a big... Um, the speciality of that particular area, in a big um, glass, like a soda um, glass, uh, with a straw. I said, oh, thanks very much. And then I started sucking at the straw, <laughs> but, it, <coughs> but it was blocked. And so I just sucked harder. <laughs> but there's nothing coming through. And I really sucked hard. My, my cheeks were going red and blowing out. <laughs> And my so-called friends, they were quiet, but they were covering their face, and I saw them just giggling. <laughs> I was doing something stupid, but they wouldn't tell me. Mm. Out of respect, please. If a monk or nun does something stupid, please tell us. <laughs> <laughs> Don't think, oh, we respect them, they'll find out by themselves. I can't say they've done something wrong. 
tell us because then what happened I took it out and it wasn't a, it wasn't a straw it was a spoon <laughs> you know these plastic spoons which are they're shaped like a straw when I was a lay person they were straws and spoons were metal things so you know what was what and now these things you get from these coffee shops and stuff they're just they're just a plastic um, tube with a small thing at the bottom you're supposed to stir something up with that <coughs> so can I understand I thought it was a straw <laughs> and that made their day they were laughing all the time <laughs> so much happiness I caused them. <laughs> so that's why when you make mistakes tell people and it, it, you make them enjoy themselves. It's a wonderful thing when you make mistakes. <laughs> so that's when a lot of stories come from all the mistakes I've made in my life. Which are many. Okay. What's this? Another one. Dear Ajahn Brahm, if I have to be still, can one develop jhanas during walking meditation? Thank you. <coughs> I never ever thought it was possible to actually develop jhanas during Morku meditation, but apparently there's only one person I've seen who actually probably does do jhanas in walking meditation. Because if you get a jhana while you're walking meditation, your five senses vanish. And so I really suspect he does jhanas in walking meditation because he's got all these cuts and bruises on his face. <laughs> <laughs> You, you lose all sensibility if you cut the touch disappears. It'll bang. We don't hear the bang. <laughs> <laughs> so, if you want to do walking meditation and you think you're getting charged, please wear a, a crash helmet. <laughs> <laughs> That's actually true. So, it's much better if you're going to do walking meditation, you feel jhana's coming on, sit down right there. Oh my goodness me. This is not a question, this is a essay. <laughs> anyway, here we go. Dear Bhante, I've read that there are four aspects for Sampajanya. Uh, refraining from activities relevant to the path, um, suitability, pursuing activities in a dignified and, and careful way, maintaining sensory restraint consistent with mindfulness, and non-delusion, seeing the true nature of reality. That is not um, how I read Sampajanya. Sampajanya literally means with wisdom. In particular, it means knowing the purpose of what you're doing. Is it relevant to uh, what you're supposed to be doing? You know, you, you, know, you have a <coughs> an object, a goal. I don't like calling it a goal, but it's the goal of no goals, if you like. The goal of being still and peaceful. Is this going to make you peaceful? And is it um, going to be conducive to that peacefulness? And are you going to maintain just that uh, peacefulness? So those are the ones which uh, is closer and makes more sense to me. And it is a commentarial stuff. So uh, does this imply that when trying to be mindful of the four postures, we need to be exercise our thinking? Not our thinking, because sampajanya means just knowing, you know, the, if it's conducive to the purpose. So we keep it simple there, <coughs> but especially it means that when you are, say, meditating, what are you meditating for? If you're walking, is it to be peaceful? Or is it to actually to, to get to your room to actually have a nice sleep? What is the purpose of what you're doing? When you're lying down, is it to actually to go to sleep or is it to uh, have a, a bit of a rest, stretch your legs so you can uh, get up later and you feel comfortable? If you're sitting down, what are you sitting down for? Is it to have breakfast or is it to actually to meditate? So what are you doing it for? So it's using wisdom for whatever you're doing. Even one of the other slow walking uh, <coughs> stories. I was at a conference in, yeah, it was a conference in, yeah, it was Vietnam. And uh, mm -hmm. 
Buddhist conference, and then we had breakout sessions. You know, breakout sessions, different different topics, and you go to the rooms which you, you know, interest you, and then bhikkhu uh, ordination, um, uh, education of kids, service, climate change, whatever it is, different rooms, and then you discuss it from a Buddhist uh, perspective. And they always have one leader who takes notes and then comes back to the plenary where everybody comes and reports on their, their uh, considerations to the whole group of people. And so there was a lot of people uh, on the desk there to actually to report back to everybody their findings and ideas on all these different subjects <coughs> at this Buddhist conference. And then when it came to one person, they said, can you please um, go to the lectern and report um, on your findings. And this person replied, yes. And very mindfully and slowly, she, without making much of a sound, she rose from her chair, pushed it back slightly, and started walking, noticing all the sensations in her foot, as she got to the lectern, which took about 10 minutes. <laughs> no exaggeration. At which point, the MC said, thank you very much, your time is up. <laughs> she never got to represent because it wasn't a time to do mindful walking. Get to the lectern and then give your presentation. Sometimes that people don't know, we call it time and place. What's the purpose of your walking here? It's actually to uh, <coughs> perform your duty of <coughs> telling all the people what you found out. So I can't resist now the story of, <laughs> of this uh, disciple over in Perth who went on to one of these retreats, was really, really peaceful, especially loved doing the slow walking meditation. And he happened to be working in Perth Zoo. <laughs> you know this word, don't you? <laughs> so the head keeper looked at him and knew he was his Buddhist, really into his meditation. And he actually asked the keeper, what task should I perform? today. Really aware and mindful of every word. <coughs> so the head came on, crikey, what could I do for him this morning? You know, he'll get back into, into up the gears in a few moments, but he thought, ah, great job. Please look after the tortoises. <laughs> Appropriate. Yes. So he slowly walked towards the tortoise cage. A couple of hours later, the head keeper decided to check up on him. <laughs> and he saw this man next to the tortoise enclosure with the gate wide open and all the tortoises gone. <laughs> And he asked the, the fellow, the meditator, what happened? <laughs> well, I opened the gate and whoosh. <laughs> <laughs> Even tortoises move faster than the meditators. <laughs> okay. Please, <laughs> you're not putting people down, but it's just good fun. Thank you, for, thank you for your profound teachings on tortoises. <laughs> <laughs> and guided meditation. If there are direct correlation between the four jhanas and the four stages of enlightenment, 
page and page 50, can you be, become a street winner without attaining the first jhana? I think I've answered that question already. You can become entered to the stream <coughs> without the first jhana, but you get the first jhana all the way somewhere. Why not? You let go. That's what it means having the faith in the teachings enough to be on the path. You know, you follow the instructions. <coughs> Ajahn Brahm, could you please explain what giving blessing is? Whenever Venerable Chandra sneezes, you say, bless you. <laughs> is that giving blessing? <laughs> well, sometimes the blessings is just, um, uh, we have chants, but the chants are just, uh, just words. It's what is behind the words, especially if you know the meaning. If you know the meaning, they can have some power. Some of those chants which we do are just, whoa, really powerful. Sometimes we do them in Pali, so you can't understand them. You know why? That is because if the monks and nuns make a mistake, you don't know. <laughs> in other words, we can get away with it. As it happened to me, I was tired. <coughs> Sorry. I was tired when I did a blessing for a marriage. I did a blessing you now in Pali. I was really lucky I did it in Pali because once I started, because of tiredness, I actually realised I was giving the, the, uh, the chanting for a funeral. <laughs> it could have been a Freudian slip, I don't know, but anyway, I did the funeral chanting for them and I never let them know. <laughs> and you know what? They're still happily married. <laughs> Amazing, isn't it? <coughs> but anyway, that's um, so. Sometimes, if you're really alert, mindful, and you give it some oomph to it, it's amazing what can it do? Because it's just the power of your mind or somebody else's mind. What exactly is giving? Protection? Yes. Sometimes encouragement? Yes. Sometimes. In what way is it helpful? Well, you know, it's really helpful if you um, have all your friends come, say, on a marriage. It means that they're behind you. It reinforces <coughs> it. It's like you've got support. And just that much is amazing to have support. And so you get all those fans chanting, you'll never walk alone <laughs> yeah, at Anfield. And that's why I don't like soccer, because I like being alone. <laughs> <laughs> So anyway, so sometimes that chanting does lift people up and raise their spirits. It's only words, but it's just when somebody's behind you, and of course deeper than that, it's mind to mind, it can actually really get, get you going. What about righteous anger, e.g. of God, etc.? That's one of the reasons I couldn't really understand God. There's no such thing as righteous anger. Because if you, you know, someone's done really something very, very bad, and you get anger, they don't see that bad person's deed, they just see your anger. That's the trouble, if you shout at somebody, you know, you may have a reason to shout at you, but they just think, Ajahn Brahm's lost it. <coughs> Rightly so. Anger is nowhere near as powerful as being calm. Somebody's up in front of you and shouts at you. <coughs> I always teach that one of the wonderful things is the one minute of silence. So maybe your partner is just right in your nose and rah, 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 rah. and as soon as they finish you want to go back again. Rah, 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 rah. You talk about me, what about you? Rah, rah, rah. You've got no right to, that's not what happened. Rah, 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 rah. Instead of doing that, they're rah, 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 rah. <laughs> <laughs> and then you just look at them peacefully and they're silent for a minute. Because if you're not adding to the argument there's only one thing they can reflect upon, what they just said. It gives them a moment of reflection of the inappropriate speech they just delivered to you. <coughs> if you argue back, they haven't got the opportunity to listen to that. So, one minute silence is really great when people argue with you. Hard thing to do, but wonderful if you can do it. <coughs> great help. Yeah? Yeah? Um, I, I've just 
Oh, no, it wasn't. Uh, he wasn't actually, uh, he just used strong words. Oh, yeah. <coughs> but sometimes uh, people try to use strong words, but sometimes are they trying to use it? If you act a part enough, you become that part. It's, I remember reading a Time magazine once, there was a, <coughs> a book which I read, you know, it's one of Oliver Sacks' books, you know, Awakenings. You know, when he gave uh, some people El Dopa and they had some disease and they actually came alive, came out of the coma. And they made a movie out of that. I think, who was it? Um, I forget who the actor was, Robert De Niro. <coughs> Robert De Niro was playing one of the people. And he was like a very excellent actor. Oliver Sacks was consultant. And he really got into the part of one of these people suffering this disease and coming out of it with El Dopa, or whatever that is. But anyway, that some dopamine um, thing. But anyway, that Oliver Sacks got very scared when he saw um, Robert De Niro starting to point his feet in, which was a classic sign of that disease. He was imagining the disease, really living the part, really getting into the role so much, he was actually becoming that role. And that was actually quite scary. I know that, who was it, uh, Laurence Olivier and the Vivian Lee, uh, who was no, both, uh, well, Vivian Lee started Gone with the Wind. And Laurence Olivier you know, said in a biography that <coughs> she got so into the role of Scarlett O'Hara, really into it, she almost became that person. So be careful what you play at, what you pretend to be. You actually subconsciously assume some of those, those characteristics. So if you act angrily, you become angry. That's one of the reasons why already in this retreat, <coughs> or maybe some little suggestion. Imagine you're the Buddha under the Bodhi tree. Peaceful, nothing more to be done, fully enlightened. There's many things about enlightenment you may not know of, but when you imagine that, some of those things start arising in you. So I don't know the psychology of that, but play acting actually it brings up the reality. So anyway, that's one of the reasons why it's not good to play act and get angry. Or even pretend. It doesn't work. It's much better to use other ways. I'd rather call it righteous anger, white lies. People who do um, precepts. You know the old five precepts? Not uh, killing, not um, stealing, not committing adultery, no sexual misconduct, rather, <coughs> not lying, and not taking alcohol or drugs. And so they say, oh, come on, middle way, just a little bit. Just a little bit of drinking, Christmas time, just a little bit. And so, well, okay. Just a little bit of killing, a little bit of murder, a little bit of stealing, a little bit of sexual misconduct. <laughs> the little bit is only about, about alcohol or drugs. So people justify some of these things. Thank you very much, Ambram and Venerable Chandler, for all so far. I practice five rhythms dance, natural dance, and go into a sort of trance with the moment, movement where my movements are not in my control and many insights come up. It also brings loving kindness to all our hearts. Is this a form of meditation? I don't know, five rhythms, Jack. I haven't got a clue what it is. I've never seen that. But anyway, <coughs> I figure it out, but sometimes dancing, at my age. <laughs> Maybe I can do belly dance. <laughs> But well, that would gross everybody out. <laughs> so, 
<laughs> because of that. I don't know what Fatima's dance is anyway. Fatima's speeds of music. Fatima's speed all at the same time? No. <laughs> okay. Anyway. So is this your question? Is that what you do? <laughs> <laughs> I don't know all that noise. <laughs> I really don't know, but it certainly can't get into jhanas, otherwise it's not. <coughs> if the meditation is not going well, e.g. pains, lots of thinking, would it be better to stop or to try to continue? Stop. Just like that novice. Stop. Stop trying to meditate, stop doing stuff. If it's not being peaceful, if you're getting pains, etc., it's going in the wrong direction. You think you're meditating, but it's getting sort of unhappy, unpleasant, uncomfortable. So instead, just go and lie down in your bed and let go. You find you let go and you're really peaceful. You're actually meditating, and you're not trying to meditate. You're not trying to get somewhere. So you're just giving up. This is good enough for me. And then you're very peaceful. <coughs> very peaceful. So, peaceometer. I haven't mentioned that since the first day. How peaceful are you? One to ten. It's measuring, yes, I know, but one to ten, how peaceful are you right now? What makes you more peaceful? What makes you more agitated? If it makes you more agitated, you go in the wrong direction. It may be watching the breath, it may be doing nibbitas or whatever, I don't care, but if you're making you unpeaceful, wrong direction. So find out what makes you more peaceful. And if you do, then you find out what letting go really is. So letting go, open the door of your heart, making peace, being kind, being gentle. That's what moves the pisometer needle closer and closer to one. Somebody once asked me, and this is the reason why I got this pisometer thing up. <coughs> They've been meditating with me a long time and said, I know I'm supposed to let go. What is letting go? What is it? I know it's important, but I don't know what to do. So that's the answer I gave them. Look at your pisometer. Trial and error. Mindfulness gives you feedback. What moves the needle down? Closer to zero. What moves it up? Closer to ten. <coughs> Experiment. Try this, try that. We'll always be watching what moves the needle closer to peace. If it goes closer to peace, that was letting go. So you learn that. That's what compassion is. That's the other thing. Are you compassionate? Do you know what compassion actually is? We assume these things. We assume we know what compassion is. Everyone knows what compassion is. Especially, well, I'm a Buddhist. I do compassion. What is it? Actually, I'm not really sure. If you really were compassionate, then you'd be at peace. You'd be kind to yourself. If you know what compassion is, so again, See that needle <coughs> being tense or being peaceful? Whatever moves the needle down is compassion, kindness. Open the door of your heart this moment. And to you, everything, hold on. So that's what I, I encourage you to try. Peace on with the meditation. When you do Dhamma teaching and when you guide children in meditation, how is it different? Not much different. <coughs> They're all kids, and I'm a kid as well. And somebody noticed that a long time ago, said, Ajahn Brahm, you just haven't grown up, have you? You're still playing around, telling silly jokes, open the doors for people. True. <coughs> Play is really important. And don't think you're too old to play around. Play is also where we discover new things. You play with stuff, and then you understand how it works. 
You're not afraid to make mistakes. And being a child, you make a mistake, somebody hits you, you cry. One minute later, your best friend again. Where do we lose that? The ability, yeah, no, best friend make mistakes, they hit us, sometimes they're upset, sometimes we deserve it or whatever. And five minutes later, we've forgotten it. We're playing like best of friends. Kids can forgive so easily. I don't mean some really severe trauma, but just little stuff. It seems to me that meditation brings us closer to a childlike mind. Yeah, exactly. <coughs> Fun. Play. Easy to smile and easy to laugh. Maybe I'm just reliving my old lost childhood. They say that actually, as soon as you get older and older, you get closer to being a child again. You lose your hair. You wear your pants. <laughs> you lose your teeth. Sure, you know, that's what you start. But I always notice that as you get older, your sight goes, you have to start wearing glasses, and your ears, you can't hear as well as you did. Sometimes you have to have hearing aids. <coughs> your, sort of, uh, your legs are much weaker, your hands are not as strong. There's one part of your body gets stronger the older you become your mouth. Old people can really talk. <laughs> they can go on and on and on and on and on. Everything else is worn out, but this gets stronger. That's why most politicians are old. Talk, 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 talk. <coughs> when a Christian has an experience of transportation and interprets it as being in the presence of God, a Buddhist has an experience of jhana and interprets it as nothing, as bliss. It seems both have experienced the same thing. Is it important? Does it matter how we conceptualize it? It does, because if you're a Christian, you have a jhana and it's union with God, they make you a saint. They name a school after you and a hospital. Really unfair. <laughs> Religious discrimination. You, know, you get a jhana and it's a union with bliss and nothing, and they just, you don't name a school after me. There's no, there's no school named St. Brahms <laughs> or St. <Saint> Chandas. <laughs> Thank goodness. <laughs> Seems both are experiencing the same thing. This is important. It's actually how you use it. Remember, jhanas aren't enough to become enlightened, it's just <coughs> learning sort of. How, what they mean, and how they fit into things. Okay. How are we going? Oh, not bad. I am scared about going into a jhana and not waking up or coming round in time to get to work, etc. <laughs> 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 what a really good excuse. <laughs> you go to your boss and say, Say I'm late today. I was in Ghana. <laughs> How do I, can I permit myself to go deep inside when I, I lose sense of time? That's what you have to do, you just give yourself that some uh, <coughs> suggestion. Got to come out in time to go to work. <coughs> it's a tough suggestion to make, I suppose I'm better. I am struggling with the apparent paradox of being satisfied, content with imperfection, non-striving, while ultimately hoping for seeing enlightenment, which is a form of perfection. Dear Ajahn Brahm, can you please help me see this more clearly? Yeah, it's not that hard to see. Uh, how's my performance been of this retreat? Perfect? I've made lots of mistakes. I've told a lot of old jokes. I have got to a punchline and laughed before I deliver the punchline. <laughs> <coughs> I've had cups of tea and dribbled it down my robe. <laughs> I'm overweight. I'm imperfect. But would you like me to be different? Sometimes 
Well, people think imperfection is called being human, approachable, being lovable. You know, when I was in Thailand, my Thai and Lao were perfect. Ajahn Chah would ask me to translate for him. <coughs> I'd be invited to places to give talks in Thai. But then, when I got to Australia, I didn't use it that much, and you lost a lot of the fluency in Thai. Hear everything, understand everything which is said. But sometimes speaking it back, sometimes you say the wrong words. <coughs> After many years in Thailand, a whole group of people came from Thailand and they asked me, can you give us a talk in Thai, a Dhamma talk in Thai? So I haven't used Thai for, you know, for Dhamma talk for a long time. So no, no, please, give it a try. <coughs> so I gave them a Dhamma talk, 20 minutes, really nice Dhamma talk. And afterwards they all said, sadhu, 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 that's amazing, that's wonderful. So really, you understood it. So well, we didn't understand it, but it was the first time we've ever heard a Dharma talk in Pali. <laughs> <laughs> hey, well, the Pali was Thai. Oh, we didn't know. <laughs> <laughs> but it's, so I remember asking some of the Thai, stu Thai supporters there, "Should I take some Thai lessons and brush up my Thai?" I said, "No." He said, it's really lovable and cute. You know, when people talk Thai in a sort of a strange accent. There's mm -hmm. only one person who talks Thai like you. Mm -hmm. We know you, we understand what you mean. But don't change. We love you as you are. And that's sort of opened up a lot of understanding what perfection is. You don't have to be perfect to be loved. And the idea there is, I've said this many times, go out and see the trees in the forest. <coughs> There's never a perfect tree in the forest, at least not one which is dead straight. They're all damaged. Every tree in the forest is damaged goods. Crooked, bent, twisted, bumps on the bark, <coughs> holes in the bark all over the place. But that's why they're beautiful. I wouldn't have the trees any other way. I remember saying that in a, oh, you, don't, you don't understand this language. I was invited to give a talk on mental health group, it was a mental health conference, and it was to the, the clients, not <coughs> the professors, not the lecturers, not the psychologists, but the people who were listening to all this, the clients. And apparently as soon as I came in, this one woman who had been in the system a long time, she came up to me afterwards and to apologise. Please excuse this language. She said, who's this wanker coming in to teach us? You know what that word means in English? <laughs> so she apologised for thinking that. Because during the, the talk, that simile of the trees made her weep. Because I said that there's no tree in the forest which doesn't belong. The bent, crooked, damaged ones. They belong in this wonderful forest called humanity. And some of the most twisted and damaged are the most beautiful. If you go to a forest and look for your favourite tree, the one you like to have your photograph taken next to, the one you want to go back to again and again and again, is the bent, twisted, knobbly ones. The ones been damaged by the storms of life. They're my favourites. So, straight away, not stigmatising, not rejecting, valuing every human being, every being, even the ones which look a bit strange, are valued. Welcome. Well, that's why she loves that. Thank you so much. Thank you. Okay. <laughs> I, I and my wife have kind of decided not to have children as crossing the dangerous flood of samsara is more important. I get second thoughts sometimes though. Having a child might mean about 20 years of precious time in our lives that we could spend on practicing the Noble Eightfold Path. Uh, could well, path to achieve liberation is taken away from us. Are we being selfish? Should we give another being a chance and somehow cram the sun patches into our lives while bringing up a child? 
What are Buddha's thoughts on married couples not having children when they can and prioritizing enlightenment over that? We could be most grateful for any advice. I don't know if you've got any brothers and sisters who have a child, but look after them for a weekend. <laughs> No, it's just, it's just your choice. And the wonderful thing in our modern world is you don't have to have a child. And no one is going to say, what's wrong with you? You know, you know there's nothing happening in the bed with your partner. Are you infertile or whatever? Now it's a choice which you can make. Even the choice to actually to live as a single woman now is possible for you and is acceptable. Before they think there's something wrong with you or up with you. <coughs> we live in a great age, you know, where we can be free to be LGBTQIA or M, N, Mark Nunn. There's nothing wrong with that. In other words, we can choose without the pressure of our parents, our sort of friends and colleagues, which is a wonderful time. So if you want, to be single without uh, any partner, fine. Even, you know one of the weirdest things, the celibacy. People think now that really is the most deviant form of sexual perversion, <laughs> being celibate. So I you know some, in what some sense, only slightly, you can sometimes feel for what, say, the uh, the gay community went through. We can cure that, you know. We can cure you of your gayness. Like they can cure you of your celibacy. There's something weird about you. I jump up, celibate. <coughs> That's challenging for other people. It's, it's the other, not being the same. But it's a choice. And you live that choice. If ever you want to change it, especially if you're a monk or that, you can leave any time you want. You only stay because you're enjoying it. It's only benefit from it. It's fulfilling for you. So that's one of the things. If you want to be a family without a child, no problem. You can still get a lot of fulfillment, a lot of happiness, a lot of love. Sometimes people ask me, do you miss having children? And actually I say, what are you talking about? I have heaps of children. Sometimes each one of you caring for you, trying to do the best for you. So, brothers and sisters, got heaps of brothers and sisters. Grandchildren. Somebody said, sometimes they look upon me as being a granddad. I call it godfather. I've even got this wonderful nephew and niece. You know what they call me? They don't call me uncle. They call me Munkle. <laughs> Ajahn Brahm, why do we exist? Speak <laughs> for yourself. Why all this suffering and samsara? Why did life appear? Is it true that the Buddha only remembers 99 past lives, 99 eons? When did all this stuff begin? Beginning. <laughs> because that's sometimes a question sometimes the, uh, your maybe Christian friends would ask. You know, how did this world begin? Who created this world? How did it was created? Why? And there's a really neat answer to that. Even Stephen Hawking, <coughs> listen to what he says. Big Bang did start the universe. And that was actually one of my, no, that Bernard's, one of his research was white holes. In other words, black holes decay, they're not the end. There's an end. After a while, it takes a long time, the black holes decay. That's called Hawking radiation. And anyway, because he had his theory of the Big Bang, there's black holes in reverse. Black holes, you can't come out of it. Uh, big Bang is where black holes just create universe. But there's nothing before then. It's like a a singularity, an end point. But once you found out that black holes are not a singularity, that they are not the end of things, <coughs> that eventually decays, it meant that this universe, Big Bang is not the beginning of things, it's before the Big Bang. 
Anyway, <coughs> I was really interested. I was listening, and yep, he said that, confirmed it with uh, Bernard. He now knows a universe with no boundaries, no edges. And that's also including time. Not a beginning, not an end of time. How can that be? So I'll now take you a journey through our understanding of the cosmos, including time. About 500 years ago, give 100 or 200 years, <coughs> people, intelligent people, thought this earth was flat. And they were afraid of getting into a boat and sailing too far away from land. Because if you sail far <coughs> enough, you'll fall off the edge. They really believe that. And if you have that view, like I was saying this morning, view and perception, it's obvious. You know, the earth is flat. I put something around, I'm going to think around here, what have we got around? No, oops, it's got water in there. This doesn't roll forward or backwards, it's level, it's flat. So, people believe that. Now we think, how stupid can you be? This earth isn't flat, it's round, it's a sphere. <coughs> You can go into space and see it. It's a round ball, it's an orb. But it has limited area without any edges. Earth doesn't go on forever. I don't know how many square kilometers it is, but it's limited without any edges to it. It's curved. Now you go to the next level. Not flat earth, limited, but round, no edges. Space. Every astrophysicist knows this space, this limited volume. It's not, it was like, if anyone knows your physics, a very simple argument, Obler's paradox, proved that the universe cannot go on forever. It can't be in space, it has to be limited. <coughs> so, I remember as a kid, wondering, well, what happens when you get to the end of the universe? Is there like, just a drop, a chasm, like the idea of the, the edge of the world? Or is it a big wall, like Mr. Trump would like to erect? <laughs> end of the universe, no one's allowed over. Is it like razor wire fence with guard posts, like in the demilitarized zone in between the Koreas? What would it look like? An, Nothing ever made sense to me. If you have the end of the, world, end of the universe, then you can look through the other side, it's not really the end. Or how can you have a, a limit? And of course, great when you go to university, Einstein's general theory, that the universe space is curved. It's not a flat universe, it's a curved universe. So if you go fast enough, in a spaceship, in this direction, you'll come right back to Belsay Bridge. <laughs> Take a bit of a while, but you'll come back in, round again. So even the universe is curved like space, like the Earth, limited volume, no edges to it. We always think that, we thought the Earth was the centre of the universe. I remember, of course, people like Carl Sagan said, no, we're not there. We're just a small blob on the end of an insignificant spiral, not even in the centre of this big galaxy, just and not really special on the end of another sort of group of galaxies. We're not in the centre, actually, we're quite insignificant. <laughs> the Earth, as a real estate, is not really special. It's not in an extra special location. It really puts us down. We always think we're the centre of things. But this universe just goes on and on, round and round. Limited volume. Uh oh. Something happening there to the video. Must be God is objecting. It's just to intercept battery there. Okay, excellent. I'll be very quick with the rest <laughs> of the universe. So and that's just standard science, everyone knows that. Universe, limited volume, no edges. 
nothing in the middle, nothing central. So now we go to the next level, time. Most people are still flat timers, like flat earthers. If you go far enough, flat earth, you fall off the edge. There'll be a beginning and end. Flat space people who believe that you can keep going on and on and on or you get to an end of the universe. Flat timers, we believe we go far enough back in time, we come to the beginning of time. Creation, whatever you call it. If you go far enough into the future, you come to the end of time, again. Any concept which has a beginning has to have an end. It's a limit, <coughs> it's a limit, it's an edge, it's a boundary. So what if time was curved? Limited duration with no edges, like planet Earth or space. Curve, round, go far enough, comes round again. Another eon. And that means no need for creation, no need for endings. Round and round and round, like everything else in the universe, in life. Don't be a flat timer. People in the future will wonder how stupid people could be. They accepted beginnings of time and <coughs> ends of time. It just goes round and round and round. Problem solved. I'm sorry, but now God is out of a job. <coughs> so, I know we're going over time, but I just mentioned, it just goes on and on and on. <laughs> <laughs> now, one last question, I'll stop. Could you explain how Sam, Vi and the others support each other when ascending Mount uh, Analog, no, not Analog, Mount Samadhi, Meditation Mountain? Inviting me, the Sutta classes are there to explain where to point the mind you cultivate through Samatha. This suggests we need a degree of stillness prior to Vipassana. Yeah, of course. And you need some Vipassana to get to stillness. They all work together. Attempting this with my mind at the start of this week would have been like attempting brain surgery at 70 miles an hour using a spoon. <laughs> I wouldn't do that. So, anyway, knife might be better. Not a spoon. I get a spoon. <laughs> anyway, so it's a nice metaphor. Uh, but the actually was a start. I remember the metaphor is the most interesting. What's the rest of the question? <laughs> oh yeah. Sam by uh, meta. Now, first of all, you have things like <coughs> uh, kindness. Uh, no, not kindness. Sorry, like uh, peace, samatha. What's it? Calm and insight. But so often we forget the kindness. Meta the dog is so important. Without kindness you'll never find any peace or any insight. In fact, one of the signs of insight is you're kind. What wisdom is there if you're really mean and nasty? Someone being, I'm enlightened. Yeah! <laughs> and they're very nasty to people. That, uh, to me that makes absolutely no sense, that's got nothing to do with insight. Sometimes, don't disturb me, I'm meditating. I've got insight. Mm -hmm. And you haven't got insight, you've got anger. <laughs> but it's not me, it's not me, it just rises and falls, it's just suffering. So no, it's anger, there's something wrong there. So, we have to remember the kindness and compassion. That's such an important part, and many of you have actually told me, and it's true, that if you forget kindness when you're meditating, it doesn't work. You get stuck. So when you're meditating and come because you think it's not working, be kind to yourself. Don't take a break. Have a cup of tea. Just stretch out. Be kind to your body. Be kind to your mind. It's okay, mind. Never mind. You know, it will happen one day. You don't have to do it today. I often say, I don't know how old you are, but if you get enlightened right now, what are you going to do for the rest of your life? <laughs> so stretch it out, enjoy it. <laughs> In other words, don't be in such a rush. 
So if you do things like that, you understand just why kindness is really important in life, especially meditation. And I was hard upon myself, not giving myself any forgiveness. Meditation got nowhere. And so last I just thought, oh, you poor mind, you poor brain. You just work so hard. Just take a break. And then my mind said, oh, thank you for caring for me. And then my mind became really good friends. And peace is easy when you've got kindness. And one of the things I did once, which was really cool, <coughs> I couldn't decide whether to do meta meditation or breath meditation. So I did both at the same time. I was, gave meta to my breath. Spread meta, may all breaths, in breaths and out breaths, long and short, be happy and well. May you be free from pain and my stupid demands. If you want to stop, that's fine. May all breaths, whatever breaths they may be, whether they are weak or strong, omitting none, the great breaths, the mighty breaths, uh, the weak, and all, I went like that for a long time. And I just had so much meta to my breath. Oh, it just, deep meditation was so easy. I remember that night because I was actually dreaming deep meditation. It was one of the best nights, non-sleep I had. Blitzing out all night. That was really cool. And it all came from just having loving kindness on with breath, combining them. So you try that. Don't just watch your breath. Ah, oh, breath. So nice to me. That's why I had little teddy bears. It's my little breath. Nice breath. You try that and the meditation takes off. Unfortunately, we've only got one and a half teddy bears here. <laughs> <coughs> if ever you want to really get into deep meditation, get a teddy bear, put it in your lap, and meditate. It's not being stupid, it works. A lot of people, especially tough guys, yeah, I'm a real meditator. I'm not like this teddy bear meditation. That's kid stuff. But it works. Give it a try. Okay. Sadhu. 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 Okay. Thank you for your support. Okay, very good.